Hi, I'm Steve Fox. In this video, I'll discuss what happens when a controlled foreign corporation makes its earnings available to its U.S. shareholders, but doesn't pay a dividend. Usually, shareholders of a corporation don't pay tax on their share of the corporation's earnings until the corporation pays a dividend. Back in the good old days, before subpart F, a U.S. shareholder of a controlled foreign corporation, or CFC, could cause the CFC to loan its earnings back to the shareholder, get the use of the money, and not pay any U.S. tax. As long as there was no formal dividend declared, U.S. tax was deferred. That changed with Section 956. If a CFC has earnings and profits, or E&P, and has basis in any U.S. property, then the U.S. shareholder must include in his, her, or its income the lesser of the E&P or the basis in that property. Each of these terms is defined. There are rules to keep the same earnings from being counted twice. This Section 956 inclusion happens whether the investment in U.S. property is by a first-tier controlled foreign corporation or by a lower-tier CFC. Thus, if Al, a U.S. person, owns Beta, a CFC, which owns Capricorn, also a CFC, then if Capricorn invests e &P in U.S. property, Al will have a Section 956 inclusion. Capricorn's earnings hopscotch, skipping beta and going directly to Al. Let's go through the various pieces. The first part is earnings and profits. I cover that in other videos, but here's a quick recap. E&P, as it's called, is the tax equivalent of retained earnings. It's the corporation's net profits from all of its activities computed on a tax basis. Several types of things, like depreciation, may be computed a bit differently for E&P than for regular income tax. A corporation doesn't need to be subject to U.S. income tax to have E&P. Next, for any part of subpart F to apply, including section 956, the corporation must be a controlled foreign corporation. Here's a link to the video covering the definition of CFC in more depth. Basically, a CFC is any foreign corporation more than 50% owned by U.S. persons who themselves are 10% or more owners. A U.S. person includes U.S. individuals, corporations organized in one of the 50 states or in D.C., and partnerships operating subject to U.S. law. Ownership includes direct ownership and ownership by attribution. Finally, the CFC must have an interest in U.S. property that gives rise to basis. This can be ownership of the property or of other interests. When such basis and E&P exist, the U.S. shareholder must include an amount in his, her, or its income as if it were distributed by the foreign corporation to that U.S. shareholder directly. This inclusion is not a dividend. It is just an inclusion. This inclusion is not subject to any lower rate of tax or exclusion from income related to dividends. It is fully taxable as ordinary income. The amount of the inclusion is the average basis in the U.S. property. This average basis is the sum of the quarter-end amounts less any prior inclusions under Section 956. This inclusion, however, is limited to current or accumulated E&P less any current distributions. Let's look at an example. Jim, an American, owns 60% of Schnell GmbH, a German corporation treated as a corporation for U.S. tax purposes. Schnell has 2016 earnings 
of 100 euros and prior year earnings of 700 euros. On January 30th, 2016, Schnell loaned 200 euros to Jim's wife, who is also an American, at arm's length terms, repayable in 2017. At the end of each quarter, Schnell had an investment in U.S. property of 200 euros. It had E&P of 800 euros as of the end of the year. Thus, Jim has an inclusion under Section 956 of 120 euros, his share of the 200 euros investment in U.S. property. Jim must translate that amount to U.S. dollars as if it were a dividend on December 31st. However, the inclusion is not subject to the reduced rate of tax on dividends. If we change the facts a bit and say Schnell's 60% shareholder was Big Co. Inc., a Delaware corporation, and the loan was to Big Co.'s Michigan subsidiary, Parts Inc., then an additional, possibly favorable, effect arises. The inclusion is the same, but Big Co. is eligible for a deemed paid foreign tax credit on its share of German income tax that Schnell paid. I discussed this deemed paid foreign tax credit in another video linked here. The potential 956 inclusion is reduced by prior 956 inclusions. That's actual inclusions per the return as filed or amended, not what should have been. So if you make a mistake, you must catch up. The key to 956, then, is U.S. property. This includes tangible property located in the U.S., stock of a U.S. corporation, obligations of U.S. persons, and rights to use an intangible in the U.S. That's a pretty broad definition. In 2015, the IRS proposed regulations that would treat stock or obligations of U.S. persons held through partnerships as U.S. property. It's my view that these regulations merely clarify existing law. There are several important exceptions to what is considered U.S. property. When one of the exceptions applies, the U.S. shareholder must disclose that on his or her tax return. The idea of 956 is to cause taxation only when the shareholder or a related person effectively gets to use the CFC's earnings before there is a dividend. Thus, the CFC's money, bank accounts, and investments in unrelated person stock or debt are not considered U.S. property. This is so even for investments in unrelated U.S. corporations. In addition, certain things are excluded if they are related to international commerce, such as property the CFC owns and is in the process of exporting, and transportation assets used in foreign commerce, like containers. Loans to or investments in non-U.S. persons do not trigger 956, even if the persons are related. Thus, a loan to a fellow CFC does not cause a 956 inclusion. In the example we covered, the loan to Jim's wife was an obligation of a related U.S. person, and thus was U.S. property. Similarly, if Schnell had bought U.S. real estate or machinery located in the U.S., Jim would have a 956 inclusion. Okay, you say, I know how to get around this rule. I'll just go to my bank and borrow the money. Then I'll have my CFC do an offsetting deposit and guarantee the loan to me. Or I'll pledge the shares to the bank in support of the loan. Well, Congress already thought of this over 40 years ago. A pledge of CFC shares by a U.S. shareholder or a guarantee of related U.S. person debt by a CFC is itself 
considered an investment in U.S. property. The investment is the total amount of the loan that is the object of the pledge or guarantee. The inclusion is limited to the CFC's current or accumulated E&P at year end. Here's another example. Bidco Inc. owns Offy Limited, a Panama entity treated as a corporation for U.S. tax purposes. Offy and Bidco each guarantee a loan by Citibank to Bidco's U.S. subsidiary, Parts Inc. The loan is for $100 million. Offy's E&P is only $5 million. Bidco, the shareholder of Offy, must include the $5 million in its income. Banks usually want everyone involved in a loan to pledge all of their assets. There is a limitation on application of 956 to pledges. If a U.S. shareholder of a CFC pledges less than two-thirds of the shares it owns in support of a loan, then the pledge doesn't trigger 956. Let's vary the facts in the last example a bit to see the impact of the current or accumulated rule. Assume Offy had 3 million of current ENP, a deficit in prior ENP of 10 million, so that its aggregate ending ENP is negative. The 956 inclusion is current or accumulated ENP, so there would be a 3 million inclusion. Loans to related U.S. persons can also include amounts the CFC is to receive from commercial transactions, such as for sale of goods or performance of services. There's an exception, though. Trade receivables are excluded only if two conditions are met. First, the transaction giving rise to the amount to be received by the CFC and the amount itself must be ordinary and necessary. That is, it must be in the ordinary course of the CFC's business. Second, the receivable must be outstanding for ordinary trade terms only. The IRS has indicated that any amount receivable for sale of goods is considered to be outstanding for ordinary trade terms if it's paid within 60 days. Trade terms could be longer in some industries. There is not a similar 60-day rule for services, but it is often observed in practice. In a revenue ruling, the IRS has also granted a limited exception that allows limited short-term loans to be outstanding at quarter end and not be counted. Here's the IRS slide from training their international examiners on this issue. Loans to related persons are not considered investment in U.S. property, if three conditions are met under this ruling. First, the loans must be repaid within 30 days. Second, these loans must not be serial loans, with each refinancing the last. This is also holding in a court case. Third, there must not be loans to related U.S. persons outstanding on more than any of 60 days during the year. Before we continue, it's time for a quiz. Nine fifty six acts directly on each CFC. The inclusion skips over any intervening corporations. Here's an example. Acton, a U.S. corporation, owns Blockit, a CFC, which owns Centra, also a CFC. Blockit has big negative E&P, but Centra has positive E&P. If Centra loans money to Acton, then the loan triggers 956. By contrast, if Blockit and Centra were in the same country and Centra simply paid a dividend, the dividend would merely reduce Blockit's deficit and there would be no inclusion. When there's a 956 inclusion, the U.S. shareholder gets a deemed paid foreign tax credit if that shareholder is itself a corporation. 
I used to play some great hopscotch games to get foreign tax credits out of lower-tier subsidiaries, but Congress got wise to that, too. There's now a limit on deemed paid foreign tax credit based on the amount of taxes that would have been deemed paid had the amount been paid as a dividend up the chain. In the Acton Block at Centra example I just covered, this would mean no deemed paid credit because Blockit had a deficit. For how the deemed paid credit works, see the video linked here. Nine fifty six does not cause ENP to move. ENP stays where it is, but that ENP gets tagged as previously taxed under nine fifty six. When this previously taxed ENP is distributed, it is excluded from income of the recipient. This treatment prevents double inclusions of the ENP under nine fifty six. But since the ENP is still in the CFC that generated the 956 amount, that ENP still counts as a basis adjustment in apportioning interest expense. It also still counts as ENP for other purposes, such as determining whether a distribution is potentially a dividend or a return of capital. Prior 956 inclusions reduce the potential for current 956 inclusions. When a CFC distributes dividends to the U.S. shareholder or up the chain of CFCs, the amount of prior 956 inclusions is considered distributed first and is not counted as a dividend. These rules will be covered in a different video. Computations under Section 956 are done in the CFC's functional currency. We compute the basis in U.S. property in that functional currency, not dollars, and compute ENP in the functional currency. Then, the U.S. shareholder translates that functional currency 956 amount to U.S. dollars using the exchange rate on the last day of the CFC's tax year. This prevents movement in basis just because the exchange rate changed. 956 inclusions happen on the last day of the CFC's tax year. This is often, but not always, the same as the last day of the U.S. shareholder's tax year. So here's a summary of Section 956, a part of Subpart F. If a CFC has E&P and invests in U.S. property, then the U.S. shareholders must pick up income. The amount of income inclusion is the average basis the CFC has in the U.S. property, but limited to current or accumulated E&P. U.S. property includes specifically loans to related U.S. persons, investments in stock or equity of related U.S. persons, tangible property located in the U.S., and pledges of CFC stock and guarantees by CFCs of debt of related U.S. persons. For more information on U.S. international tax and other tax rules, see other videos on the International Tax Channel. I hope you found this useful, and thanks for learning with me.